Well, hello everybody. I'm starting this video off with something that I didn't manage to finish in my last video. I began the last video sitting in front of, well, this used to be what my lavender bed looks like, looked like, which you're seeing there now. Most of it got winter killed, and I have been working on taking away all of the dead parts and hauling out the weeds, and I've been mulching it and whatever. Uh, I think it is going to be salvageable. It's going to take a few years for it to come back. But as I said, this picture here was taken four or five years ago at least, maybe longer than that, but it was looking very good last year. Now I'll give you a little look at uh, what the finished product is after I managed to get all the dead wood out of it. Well, this is still very much a work in progress, and I suspect it will be for the next couple of years or so, but I have salvaged quite a bit of the lavender. Some of the plants actually are pretty good size, others are very tiny. But that is the heap of material that I removed. And this is a general shot of what the thing looks like now. There's still weeds in there and grass. The green areas that you see are mostly lavender. I'll take you in and show you something a little closer here. The mulch that I'm using doesn't seem to show up any more than if it was just the, the hay and grass and stuff that was there to begin with. But what I have used is a mixture of uh, wood chips, shavings, and sawdust that I use for bedding on the floor in my chicken coops. And it's mixed with chicken manure. Um, it's been out of the chicken coop now for, oh, I don't know, more than two months, I guess. And all I've taken is just off the top of the pile, the loose uh, shavings and whatever, just to, to mulch. And also, as it rains down through it, it should also produce some pretty good fertilizer. But you can still see lots of grass sticking up and all that sort of thing. I'll just continue plucking away at that through this summer. I think almost all of the plants, though, uh, there's still part of them that's alive. If I remember rightly, there were 12 or 13 and in the center, it wasn't lavender. And I'll show you some of that in just a second here. But that is what the salvaged lavender bed looks like anyway in early July here. I grew my favorite wildflower. I uh, bought a small seedling from a uh, company in Quebec that uh, specializes in breeding wildflowers. Can the Canada lily, Lilium canadensis, if you've never seen it, it's a delightful thing tiny, tiny little seedling when it arrives, and it takes five years before it produces its first blossom. And if I'm not mistaken, mine bloomed for me for three years anyway, maybe four years, and then I thought I lost it. Well, now when I'm cleaning this out, I see these strappy-looking leaves in there. Can't think of anything else that they would be. That may be the Canada lily, so I'm going to try to preserve that and see if I can what happens to it in the coming years anyway. Canada lily does a strange thing. It, it produces a new corm or bulb or whatever you want to call it every year for next year's flower, but not in the same location. It moves several inches every year. It, it migrates all over your garden. So this is off to one side of the center where the lily used to be by oh, a good meter, I guess. Anyway, time will tell if that's actually it or not, and this little clip that follows shows you what it looked like when it was here. This is the Canada lily, Lilium canadensis, definitely my favorite wildflower. And I'm thinking that's what I just showed you, those little strappy leaves. It has survived in there, hopefully with mulching it and uh, keeping it watered and whatever. Another five or six years, I'll get to see the blossom again. It did produce seeds, but I wasn't successful in getting the seeds to germinate for me, so... It has come back, I think, or has managed to survive there. And this is an allium that I haven't seen in bloom for at least five years, maybe longer. Thought I'd lost that too and found it down in amongst the weeds. I have four patches of it, which is what I always had. It started out very small and they turned into larger patches. It's called flowering onion, blooming onion, well, flowering onion, I think. Uh, and I will show you a picture in just a moment here of, of what that looked like when it was in bloom. But I'm encouraged to see the four patches there and looking quite sturdy. I'm quite sure that they may yet bloom this year now that I've got them out of the weeds. And this is what the flowering onion looks like, the allium, when it's in bloom. Uh, the skep in the middle there, 
was also given to me by the same lady who gave me the seedlings many years ago. I'm almost convinced that now that I've got this cleared out and, and mulch and that I keep it watered, that will probably bloom this summer. It's an extremely hardy plant. Been neglected for the last few years though. And there's quite a bit of this coming up in here. I think two years ago I planted Chinese lanterns in the center. There's always been an open space in the center that didn't have lavender. It got closed in more and more as the lavender plants got larger. But the Chinese lanterns, I didn't know that they were. <laughs> I know that it's very prolific. I had it before in a garden. It's very invasive, actually. It takes over. And I count... Uh, about eight or nine plants of it there in, in areas outside of even the, the, the center, but I'm going to save them all. Uh, nice looking, relatively nice looking seedlings right there now. I used a weed whacker. All my European people are laughing. You call it a strimmer. Uh, when I got started here to take the tops off of the grass and the weeds, and I didn't realize I was taking the tops off of the Chinese lantern as well. But give you a look now at what that looked like when it was in bloom. And this is what I'm talking about by a Chinese lantern flower. It's a little white blossom but then it produces this very interesting seed pod which has an edible fruit inside of it but you can cut them and dry them and uh, you know use them in dried flower arrangements. They're really quite attractive. They're also very invasive. I had it in another garden bed once. It was a long while getting rid of it, but here I go. I'm trying once again. Monday, July the 9th. I'm putting together some more clips for this weekend's video, I guess. Hopefully it'll be up this weekend. I'm about to harvest my peas. Uh, a variety, as I think I said before, is sugar lace. Edible pod pea, sugar snap pea, mange two pea, whatever you want to call them. I haven't had any cooked yet. I've been eating them every day in the garden. I love raw peas, especially when you can eat pod and all. They were a bush variety, but nevertheless, they still need support, and I didn't give them very much. They've been flopping over in all directions here. I'll be glad to get them picked and to get the vines out of the hoop house. I'll show you what I get when I finish here. And as if we haven't had strange enough weather with all the cold weather, wet weather, and finally the heat wave. Now we are under the threat of a tropical storm. The third named storm of the Atlantic season. Um, tropical storm Chris, I think, or something like that. Anyway, it's down off the southern United States and headed our way. The current uh, track has it going the other side of Nova Scotia from us. Uh, which you know, the center of it. So. But nevertheless, the outside edges of it you know, still have a lot of wind. So remains to be seen what we get. I like said this is Monday and it's due to hit here if it goes according to what the weather people think by Wednesday or Thursday. So maybe some of that will be included in this video. I prefer that it goes way out to sea and we don't get anything. Well, I'm quite pleased with that. That's a picnic basket. Not a large picnic basket, but it's about three quarters full, more than half full anyway, and it's quite heavy. Uh, the, the, it was so hot in the hoop house, I gave up. What I did was I pulled up all the vines and brought them out here and sat in the shade and pulled them off the, uh, off the vines. Uh, as I've said before, it, it's an edible pod pea, which in my opinion is wonderful this time of year. You haven't got to shell peas. I will be probably blanching these in some steam and then shocking them in ice water and freezing a lot of them. There's a lot more there than I can contend with. That was off of two short four foot rows in the hoop house and I have been growing in two places out here in the garden and they're starting to produce in the garden. So it's a very good variety. I want to show you something here. Just trying to find one that's relatively full. The older varieties of sugar snap or edible pod peas had a string that ran down that, this line on both sides. And these new hybrids don't have that. You can just snap them in two and there isn't any string. So there's nothing to do other than wash these off a little bit, cook them or freeze them. I hope there's a bit of a tomato vine showing in that. Possibly not, I can't tell once again on this screen. But in removing the vines, 
pea vines, I managed to salvage two tomato plants. This poor little thing here is one of the Sasha's Altae. It's a determinate variety. It was completely overtaken. And the second one, this is one of the uh, uh, San Marzano, the Italian heirloom sauce tomatoes. And it was growing almost as nicely as the ones in the background, but nevertheless it was being choked out by the peas. It's still Monday the 9th of July as I'm showing you this, and this is the current best guess of what Tropical Storm Chris is going to do. Uh, right now it is still just a tropical depression, but it is due to, in their prediction anyway, reach hurricane force later today. And the current direction and map there shows it getting into our area uh, overnight, Thursday into Friday morning. And by then it will be back down to a tropical depression with a hundred uh, kilometer an hour winds. Uh, it shows it reaching, I think sometime today, reaching or tomorrow, reaching 150 kilometer an hour winds, which is hurricane force. But it also, that map anyway, shows the path of it hitting uh, sort of northern Nova Scotia, central and northern Nova Scotia. I'm in the Bay of Fundy, that uh, streak of blue water that you see between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. It doesn't show that we would get uh, impacted by it very much. Quite possibly we'll get some rain and, and a bit of wind. So. Fingers crossed that that's what it actually does. I'll put another clip in sometime before I upload the video. Hopefully still it will turn further to the east and head out into the Atlantic. Wouldn't hurt my feelings at all. Well, I have been picking my hascaps. Uh, that's not every hascap that's on my three bushes, but it's most of them. All that I've got the patience for, anyway. Uh, I had a couple of people reply that have grown has caps to my last video when I was saying how bitter or sour rather these things are and I guess that's the best you can hope for both people said even when they're fully ripe they're still they still have a sour taste to them <laughs> I don't have enough to do anything with as far as making a jam or whatever usually things that are sour have a lot of pectin so they might turn out with enough sugar to make a decent jam but I'm really curious as to what's happening with them in this area of the country. I'm not sure if it was three or four years ago, probably four, that I bought these three little bushes. And I had to sign a non-propagation -prop uh, contract before they would sell them to me. Well, I don't know why anybody would ever want to propagate them. They are nasty, bitter, sour little things, in my opinion. And at that time, there was a newspaper article that I saw... Several farmers in Nova Scotia were going into them in a big way, as in buying hundreds of plants. Well, by now, their plants would be as large or probably larger than mine, better maintained. I'm very curious to see what's happening. You'd have a, a lot of education you'd have to do with your people that you're selling these to. Uh, as I say, maybe they make a good jam or whatever. But, on the bush... Uh, the most you ever find is two or three together in a cluster. There's no way they could ever be mechanically harvested. The bushes are so fragile, they'd snap and break all to pieces. So they'd be very labor-intensive to harvest them. Um, not even as, as good as like high bush, high bush blueberries. I don't know if they can be mechanically harvested or not. They're probably hand-picked, but they grow in nice big clusters and you can pick quite fast, but you'd be a long time picking enough of these, you're going to end up you know, with a high cost of, of, of harvesting the things before you even try to sell them. So I would be very curious to know if those farmers are still growing those or if they've turned them under the soil. I think what I'm going to do is make a few tarts with them. Tart tarts, if they, <laughs> they come out as sour as they are now, but I'm thinking if you add enough sugar, maybe some cinnamon or something for flavoring, that they'll make a, a decent tart. So if I do that, I'll show you the finished product. Oh, well, why not add a cooking segment to a gardening video, right? <laughs> what I'm about to make is a very simple uh, pie crust with a fancy French name. It's called Pat Brise, but it's just a butter-based pie crust. I have 350 grams of all-purpose flour 
in this food processor. And I'm adding two sticks of cold cubed butter, half pound of butter, 250 grams. Uh, and in the flour I have a tablespoon of sugar and there should have been a teaspoon of salt but I'm, I'm using butter that already has salt in it so I didn't add the extra salt. butter down to a small grain and now you add a quarter of a cup to a half a cup of uh, cold ice water depending on how much it takes to bring that into a, a dough. a little over a quarter of a cup and yeah I think that's about right I'll bring you back in just a second I've just turned it out onto a piece of plastic wrap without making too much of a mess I guess and all I do is take the plastic wrap and bring it together Sometimes easier said than done, but that usually works. Some outside of the wrap, but most of it's in the wrap. together into a, a good dough. Uh, now I'll refrigerate it for oh, at least an hour or two and I'll probably only use about half of that to make the few tarts with but it's been worked very minimally so it's, it, uh, that keeps it from being getting tough and if I look closely here I can still see yellow spots of butter. I don't suppose they're showing in the video but there's quite a bit of butter showing in it, so that will make it quite flaky when it bakes. If you don't roll it out and play with it too much in the meantime, I've done that before too. I'll bring you back and show you later on when I'm ready to put these things in the oven. All I've done is roll out the, the pastry. I'm using a large biscuit cutter. That's all I need. Let's fit them into the tart pan here. I have mixed the uh, has caps with about a little close to half a cup of sugar and some flour. Thinking the flour might provide a bit of a thickening. So if they do tend to be ju juicy, they won't be running all over the place. At least once they've cooled, I hope. I also added about a half teaspoon of cinnamon. Now I'm going to try to fill these about two thirds full. Looks like I'm going to have berries left over, I guess. The oven is preheating to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll cook them for 10 minutes at 425 and then reduce the heat to 350 and cook for another um, 15 to 20 minutes until the pastry is brown anyway. It said three quarters full. Not, I don't have a recipe for this, but I was just checking some other recipes. 
I think we're going to go with a little more than three quarters full. I'll put this on a cookie sheet in case it does bubble over. Anyway, you don't need to watch me keep filling these tart shells. I'll bring you back when they come out of the oven. Well, they've been baked and out of the oven for at least half hour. It appears to have set up quite well. The addition of a little bit of flour might have helped there. Although, like I said, these things are so sour, I'm sure there's lots of pectin in there. So it may be made like a little bit of jam in each tart. I'm not really getting a distinct flavor for the berry, but it is now sweet. It's not tart at all. And I'm tasting the cinnamon, of course, that I added. I think that would be something nice to do with them in another year, anyway. And the pastry is nice and light and flaky. I think this would work with almost any type of fruit, fresh fruit, but it gave me something to do with the sour hascaps. So that's what I did with this year's crop of them anyway. The difference a day can make, I guess, as of this morning, uh, July 10th, it looks like the path has gone far enough to the east that we won't get any of the hurricane or tropical depression, whatever it will be, when it reaches this area. Of course, this is once again subject to change without notice. These things move around quite a bit, but that's very encouraging. The uh, weather forecast on the radio this morning said we still might get some surf. Well, that's quite possible. It, uh, it will drive a lot of high waves up into the Bay of Fundy. So there may be some, some surf out at the Provincial Park to have a look at, but at least as, as of right now anyway, no damaging winds. Well, I'm getting close to putting this video together and getting it up online, but I wanted to show you what I do to freeze the peas. If you do something different, let me know. Maybe there's an easier way. This is a the steamer basket out of uh, not just an old enameled steamer. The only thing I ever use it for is blanching vegetables before I freeze them. So I don't put a lot in there, but enough to cover the bottom anyway. And I think that will do. Hopefully that gives you a better idea of how much how much vegetables I put in there, just enough to cover the bottom an inch or two of, of vegetables. And the old canner has, well it's not a canner, the old steamer has just come to a full boil. So there's only about a half inch to an inch of water in the bottom, not enough that the hot water will come up onto the peas. And I start my timer, it goes for one minute. After one minute in the steam, they get shocked in ice water. That will stop the cooking process. And I just carry on till I have enough to freeze. Once they have completely cooled in the ice water, I put them back in the colander just to drain off as much moisture as possible. They're still wet, but I don't want to put a lot of water in with them and freezing them. Then I just put them in vacuum seal bags, whatever amount you think you want. I'm doing a fair amount in mine because I think when I start using them later on I'll have some company here to enjoy them with me, so make sure I have enough in the bag for a meal, I guess. I'll probably do. I try to spread them out a bit in the bag so that they won't all be down in one end to get crushed when you vacuum seal them. Now it 
its ceiling. It has removed all of the air. And there, just finished sealing. There are two settings for this, something that's dry and something that's moist. And I chose the moist because these are still damp. And uh, I guess it didn't really take any up to the top, but sometimes it takes moisture right up to the top of the bag. So anyway, those will keep in the freezer for definitely for several months. I don't know if I want to keep them for a year or more, but I think you could probably safely freeze them and bring them out and use them for four or five months or more. Well, I will carry on and show you how many packages I get when I finish here. Well, not bad. I got four fairly large packages to put in the freezer. I had one meal myself, some that I ate, and I have a package probably as large as this or a bit larger that I didn't uh, uh, shock or, or I'm going to freeze going to visit my brother and sister-in-law tomorrow. I'm going to take those up to them. So I think that's a pretty good yield when it's off of two little short four-foot rows in the in the hoop house. So I'm pleased with that. And they're really starting to come on out in the garden. I'm going to be doing this again in a few more days, I think. They're planted in two more places in the garden and uh, really starting to produce in full bloom anyway. Well, there's two or three more things I'd like to show you in the garden and then we'll shut this down. One last look at Hurricane Chris. It's up to a Category 2 hurricane now and could strengthen some more today. But as it moves further north, it will weaken. And all of the forecasts now seem to agree that it is not going to affect maritime Canada uh, far enough offshore. It may touch the far eastern tip of Newfoundland when it goes past Newfoundland. But in this area, anyway, I guess I don't have anything to be concerned about. Very thankful of that. Well, we're out on my little front deck. That's a hummingbird feeder, and it's been hanging there now for, oh, I don't know, a month and a half, two months, I guess. The hummingbirds use it quite often. But what I'm here to show you is we're behind that uh, large rose bush, which is almost finishing. But this is that elevated planter that I have here. Um, I like it. You don't have to bend over to do anything to it, but I'm not growing anything very substantial in it. It has some peas, which you can probably see are filling out nicely, but the rest of it, there was another bird feeder hanging there all winter with bird seed in it. And of course the birds dropped a lot of the seed down onto the top of the planter. I'm just letting it grow to see what, what, a, what comes out of it. Already there is some sort of a grain here. I don't know what, uh, if I can get that over so you can see it. I don't know quite what that is. Uh, anyway, it's the closest I'm going to get it to you, I guess. But it's obviously some sort of a grain. I don't know what millet looks like. Uh, this isn't, to me, it doesn't look like oats or, or barley or wheat or anything. Not that I'm an expert on any of them, but I have spent some time on a big farm out west. And there is a hummingbird, if you heard that or not, but he, he left because I'm too close. It has something that looks like bindweed, tiny little heart-shaped leaves, and bring up a leaf anyway. And something has already bloomed and produced its seeds. If I can get a seed off the vine, there we are. The seed sort of looks like a miniature uh, Lunaria, the silver dollar plant, or called Honesty, I think, in, in England. I mean, a very small version of it, one seed in the middle, or at least, no, there's more, there's several seeds, huh? I can see there in the middle. Don't know what that is, or how they harvest that and get it into bird food, but there it is. There's also tansy in there, and I know there was no tansy in the in the bird seed mix, but my property has been overtaken by tansy and it's my fault. I planted it many years ago. Just thought it was a nice herb that I'd like to have around. Well, <laughs> talk about invasive. Anyway, let's go out to the hoop house. There's a few things I want to show you out there. 
I'm still on the way out to the hoop house, I guess, but I wanted to stop by this plum tree. I can't remember the name of the variety of the tree, but it's a small purple plum. Makes an excellent jam, and it has set quite a bit of fruit this year. I've certainly seen it have more fruit on it, but I think there's probably enough to make a batch of plum jam, which is what I really want to do. We did that about three years ago, the last time it had a good crop, and it was delicious. Next door to it, I've shown it many times as a tree that started as an, an arctic apricot, I believe. Got winter killed. It wasn't so used to our arctic, I guess. And the thing came up from the root uh, that it was grafted on, and it's a plum tree. I managed to get one or two yellow plums on it years ago. This year I was all excited. I think I told Southpaw Davy um, it looks like it has set fruit. Well, it did, and I suspect it's been doing that every year. The, the blossoms that don't get pollinated turn brown, and you, you know they didn't get pollinated, and the ones that do get pollinated start to produce a tiny plum. And then the tree rejects every one of them. I've never encountered anything like that, but that's what it does. If anybody can explain why, I, I'm thinking it must be a good pollinator for this particular plum tree as well, because the one that I bought as a pollinator one that has a Japanese-sounding name that I can never remember. Had very few blossoms on it this year, and I got a good set of, of plums. So I'll be glad to keep it as a pollinator, but I don't understand why a tree would... You know, obviously, I, I was thinking it didn't get cross-pollinated but another tree, but it has been because they were starting to develop, and then the tree rejects every one of them, and they all fall on the ground. Let's go to the hoopos. We finally made it to the hoop house. The first thing I want to show you is this is my largest uh, gherkin, European gherkin, cucumber or not cucumber, depending on who you talk to. And it is in bloom. Two blossoms, and as I've said before, it is what they call parthenocarpic. It doesn't, the blossom does not have to be pollinated in order to produce a gherkin. So lots of more buds coming there too, and Several others are plants are almost large enough. They'll be blooming soon, so I have hopes, at least, of making some pickled gherkins. Starting to get some tomatoes developing. This one is on one of the determinants called Beaver Lodge. I have to remember to do some online research. I, I know it's supposed to be larger than say a cherry tomato. I don't think it's a large slicer, probably something what they call a saladette um, tomato, whatever. It is setting good fruit. I also have some fruit setting on Sasha's Alte and the uh, uh, San Marzano Italian heirloom tomato. Quite a few of them have blossom buds that I'm sort of tickling every day. So. I'm very pleased now with my tomatoes, at least, after the struggle that they went through. Just one more little thing I'd like to show you and talk about, and then we'll shut this down. What we're looking at here is the top of one of the San Marzano. Um, it's probably over a meter tall at this point. And what I want to show you is, if you can see that sort of string going up in the air, that's a, I think, 50-pound test monofilament fishing line tied to a, the uh, purlin, the center purlin, that supports all of the hoops, hold up the roof here in the hoop house. And I, sh I know I showed this last year, and it's, it's quite common, but if anybody hasn't seen them before, I wanted to talk about these again. It's, I did it last year, and this is my second year with them, and it is the best tomato support system I have ever encountered. You just tie that uh, fishing line to, the, to something high above it, and put enough fishing line out that it goes down to ground level, and you keep clamping these little things on. They, uh, they clamp to the fishing line, and then they go around the vine and snap together, it is very sturdy. Uh, that particular vine has got one, two, three, it's got four on it so far. I think I put more on them than a commercial grower would. I, I, they're cheap and plentiful, so I, and I don't have that many tomato plants, so I use, tend to use a lot of them for the support. Uh, it's really a good system. If you haven't used it, if you have some way of using it, I would recommend it. it I don't see how it would work outside in the garden, but possibly you can think of some way of, of using it out in the garden outside. You'd have to have something high above the 
the plant that you would attach the line to. And I don't know how it would work if there was much wind or anything. But I've never had great success even here in the hoopos with anything else. Once they get loaded with, with tomatoes later in the year, which is what we hope, they will get loaded with tomatoes. I uh, always had problems with things falling down, dipping over from the weight, even though there's no wind in here. And well, last year these things worked perfectly, and I'm hoping for a similar performance this year. Well, that will conclude this rather lengthy video. If you're still there, thank you very much for watching.